welcome Professor Porter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I should get a copy of that. I don't think I could have written that better myself. I don't think I wrote it, but uh, um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And uh, Stephen beat me to it. I th was thinking I was going to be the first person to present a paper that actually followed the title that's in your brochure. Uh, but uh, Stephen did beat me to that. I will uh, be giving a paper on Paul and the process of canonization. Actually, this is my, my second sort of kick at the uh, proverbial can uh, in this. I uh, edited a book called The Pauline Canon. I, I did a, an essay in that on the development of Paul's canon. And the book got very good reviews. Of course, what would you expect me to tell you? But uh, it did, really. Uh, except that for my essay, sometimes people pointed out that uh, I, it was an excellent survey or whatever of the evidence, but I had hoped to do something a little bit more than that and to actually make a positive and constructive proposal, and uh, that seemingly got a little bit uh, overlooked. And so I want to take this time to basically not repeat what is in that essay as an encouragement to you to uh, mortgage your house and buy a copy of this from Brill. Uh, but uh, instead, I will just briefly summarize a couple of the, the views um, that I present there and then go into a little bit more detail on two positions. One is uh, by David Trobish and then the kind of proposal that I am, am putting together here. But my paper really does address this issue of Paul and the process of canonization or perhaps better, uh, the relationship of Paul to uh, the process of canonization. And uh, if you want to remember the previous paper, Torah, 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 there are three parts to my paper as well. And the first Torah would be some background material. The second would be David Trobish's proposal. And the third would be my own. So in the introductory material, let me just state that when we're talking about the development of Paul's canon, we have to keep in mind, I think, that there are three sorts of periods and how they relate to each other. The first is the period during which Paul's letters would have actually been written, whether they were by Paul or somebody else. The second period is the period during which the letters would have been gathered together into some kind of a corpus. And the third is the period of transmission, during which time these texts and these letters then were firmly established and used by the church. Now the question becomes, how much overlap is there and what span of time do these three periods extend over? And I and my third will make a proposal, my third section, that these three periods actually overlap far more than some research has indicated and over a shorter period of time. Now if I had uh, a lot more time, I could go into some of the better known and already discussed theories of the formation of Paul's canon. Let me just give the four of them to you very briefly. You're probably familiar with some of them. If not, perhaps it'll be something to spur you to think a little bit more about them. Uh, Lee mentioned a little bit earlier today about Theodor Zahn, and uh, Zahn and Harnack are known for a theory called the gradual collection theory, or sometimes known as the snowball theory. And uh, that means that there was a gradual period of time, kind of like a snowball gathers its snow together, uh, that uh, the canon was formed over this period. Many of you will be familiar with another theory by Goodspeed and then Goodspeed and Knox, and that's called the lapsed interest theory. The idea there was that after Paul got done writing and dying, people had kind of forgotten about him, and there was a period of lapsed interest. Book of Acts was written, and then somebody said, you know what we really need to do is gather this guy's letters together. A third view is the composite view, or sometimes called the composite anti-Gnostic view of Walter Schmittals. Basically, Schmittals, if you know anything about him, believes that there no letter can be taken at face value. Every one of them is a composite of many, many fragments, and uh, he argues that we have a very complex set of lots of different bits uh, being brought together. And the fourth uh, is the personal involvement theory. Personal involvement, like uh, Charlie Mole would suggest Luke and Donald Guthrie Timothy, as uh, some of these peoples who were, were involved possibly in bringing uh, the letters of Paul together. But I'd like to pick up then for my second major section with a form of involvement theory, and it's called the Pauline involvement theory, or Trobish theory. And Trobish concentrates upon the first four letters 
and Paul's possible personal involvement in them. If the theory of an early personal involvement by a close associate of Paul has merit, and many of these theories that I just went breezingly through would make that kind of a suggestion, Paul himself could also have been involved in this process, Trobish suggests. And this is not a new idea. In fact, working about the same time as Trobish, a man named Richards argues that Paul used a secretary, much like Cicero used his secretary, Tyro. Hence, Paul had copies made of his letters, and these letters constituted the origin of the Pauline letter collection, possibly then assembled by Paul's secretary, Luke. Trobish, however, adds some significant detail to justify this position. So, for example, Trobish notes that many of the early manuscripts, especially the early codexes, follow essentially a modern canonical order. However, P46, the oldest of the Pauline manuscripts, arranges the Pauline letters essentially according to length. Hebrews is the one book of the Pauline group that varies regarding ordering, which Trobisch takes to mean that it was added later to the 13-letter Pauline collection. In P46, it goes Romans, then Hebrews, then 1st and 2nd uh, Corinthians. Trobisch further believes that the common form of title of the Pauline letters implies their having been gathered together under the name of Paul. And he also posits that the overall arrangement of the letters is based upon the addressees, with the letters to the church congregations preceding the letters to the individuals. And they were being placed in order by length within these two groups. Now, what do you do with 1st, 2nd Corinthians? He argues that those to the same person or place were kept together as well. Now, Trobisch also claims to establish that Romans to Galatians is a single literary unit and that, quoting, it is highly probable that this co old collection was edited and prepared for publication by Paul himself. This, he contends, was the first stage in a three-stage process. He believes that Paul edited these four authentic letters so that as to unite them together in terms of the thought and amount of personal detail included. The second stage is expansion of the corpus and the third, comprehensive editions. Accepting Goodspeed's analysis of Ephesians, Trobisch sees Ephesians, which is now in its rightful place according to the tradition, as the introductory letter for the appendix to the Pauline corpus. And these stages led to the canonical Pauline collection. Now, <coughs> J. Murphy O'Connor has come along as well, adopted a similar three-stage process, except he doesn't uh, think that you have to have uh, Paul as the, the person who instigated this, but he comes to very similar conclusions. Now, Trobisch's formulation of this theory of direct Pauline involvement combines a number of what seem to be contradictory or at least unusual ideas such as the notion that Paul may have been instrumental in initiating the collection of his own letters while also limiting the authentic Pauline corpus to the old F.C. Bowers' four authentic letters. One of the major issues is how Trobisch suggests that Paul instigated the collection of his letters. Trobisch introduces the idea very subtly. Having noted the three purported stages of development of letter collections and working backwards, Trobisch suddenly concludes by claiming that it is highly probable that Paul was responsible for stage one, the authorized recensions. This is posited rather than proved, but as Murphy O'Connor has shown, Paul's direct involvement is not necessary to a theory of stage development such as Trobisch proposes based upon ancient canonical lists. There's little to no direct evidence to promote this idea of Pauline involvement except the analogy of Cicero and Tyro. However, as Trobisch notes, Cicero makes an explicit claim regarding the gathering of his letters which Paul does not make in the letters that Trobisch recognizes as authentic. Furthermore, the analogy of Cicero is instructive. Cicero's known collection, the one that Trobisch refers to explicitly in his work, consists of letters of recommendation, not the purportedly composite letters of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, for example, that Trobisch and Murphy O'Connor argue for. There's a further difficulty in Trobisch's distinction between public and private letters. Trobisch apparently needs to claim that Paul's letters are public letters to show that such letters were kept in copies, as a private letter, he believes, is one that needed to be sent to fulfill its purpose and is never a copy but the original. Not only are both of these specific characteristics questionable, but the entire construct of public versus private letter has been criticized. 
It's also evidence that even private letters regularly had copies made. Trobisch accepts a fragmentary hypothesis for the Corinthian letters and takes Romans 16 as a cover letter being sent with a copy of Romans. Much recent scholarship wishes to argue for the integrity of the Corinthian letters and Romans, however. This conclusion jeopardizes Trobisch's analysis since Romans 16 introduces a distinctly personal element that he finds unsuitable for the four public letters of Paul. However, there's also much critical scholarship that wishes to see fragmentary letters in the second part of Trobisch's collection, such as Philippians. Trobisch does not explain this later process of formation in any kind of detail, but it would seem unnecessary to have fragmentary letters found in the later pseudepigraphic letters. For Trobisch to admit that there are any authentic letters in the rest of the 13 threatens his theory, since it alters the symmetry that he sees among the three major parts. However, the critical consensus today is that at least seven of the letters are authentic, including 1 Thessalonians and Philippians in the church letters and Philemon in the personal letters. To allow for any of these letters to be authentic would indicate that contrary to Trobisch, it was not necessary for Paul to be involved with the authentic letters for them to be collected, which is the heart of Trobisch's scheme, or that his rigidly following the principle of decreasing length within each section does not hold as a means of dividing the three sections of the Pauline canon. Few scholars see Ephesians as forming an introductory letter suitable for the Pauline canon. In this case, even a reduced canon of nine letters. Nor is it found at the head or foot of any Pauline letter list. Once all this is admitted and the possibility of other letters broached, then the unity of Trobisch's group is lost, and with it, much of the strength of his theory. And so now to the, to the third part. Pauline or personal involvement theory of the 13 Pauline letters. There's no entirely satisfactory theory as to the origins of the Pauline letter collection. It may always be the case that critical scholarship cannot agree on a convincing explanation of how it is that the Pauline letter collection emerged. There is, however, despite the claims of Goodspeed and Knox, no substantive evidence that Paul's letters were ever neglected or had fallen out of use. So emerge it did, though not without plenty of controversy and confusion from virtually the earliest list to the present debate over the timing and process of such formation, the limits and ordering of such a collection, what constitutes the authentic letters in such a collection, and what were the later pseudepigraphic additions. Taking the previous discussion fully into account, in this section I wish to develop my own account of the gathering of Paul's collection of letters. I wish to begin from a number of assumptions that emerge from the previous discussion. The first assumption is that virtually all theories, including Zahn Harnack with Marcion, Goodspeed Knox with Onesimus, Mole with Luke, Guthrie with Timothy, Trobisch with Paul himself, are agreed that the gathering of the Pauline corpus required personal involvement at a close level. Even the Pauline school theory appears more convincing if one can find recognizable and named people in that school. As a result, the proposals of personal involvement range from Paul himself to early followers to his opponents to later followers and supporters. Despite the diversity of possibilities and extent of time that they cover, it would appear that we should recognize or at least concentrate on establishing reasonable procedures to determine who such people might have been and the kinds of actions that such individuals could have taken. A second assumption is that theories that require the least dissection of the individual letters have a better chance of being accepted as probable and of being parallel to the situation of other ancient writers and collectors of their letters, for example, Cicero. The more fragmentary hypotheses, it seems, offer less ground for establishing firm conclusions, whether these are in terms of Schmittals as fragmentary theory with 6 Corinthian, 1 Galatian, 3 Philippian, 2 Roman, and 4 Thessalonian letters, or Trobisch's theory with 7 Corinthian and 2 Roman letters, but no other fragmentary letters. This is especially seen in dealing with the Corinthian letters. The fact of two and only two Corinthian letters is a strong argument against extravagant multiple letter hypotheses. This says nothing about how such fragmentary hypotheses are arrived at. A third assumption is that whenever it may have happened, the letters were probably gathered in a particular place. As we've noted above, the places proposed 
have included a number. Let me repeat them. Here it'd be Rome, Smyrna, Antioch, Ephesus, Corinth. These have been proposed by a range of different theories. This locational assumption coincides with an individual being involved and points away from there being many Pauline letter collections existing for very long in separate places, an observation supported by the textual evidence. The amount of commonality among the early manuscripts, as both Trobish and Murphy O'Connor have shown, clearly supports this assumption. The facts as we have them make it clear that the Pauline canon emerged fairly early in a form recognizably similar to the New Testament 13-letter canon. P46 is, as Trobish states, quote, the oldest manuscript of the letters of Paul. This manuscript, which has been dated from anywhere from A.D. 80 to around A.D. 200, consists of the following Pauline letters. Romans, I'll put in parentheses Hebrews, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, and 1st Thessalonians. There are a number of important observations to make. Not only does it have Hebrews after Romans and before 1st and 2nd Corinthians, but it has Ephesians before Galatians. And, of course, it breaks off in 1st Thessalonians. Trobish claims that the amount and type of variation in placement of Hebrews, along with other internal and external differences, indicates that Hebrews was not part of the original Pauline corpus, but was added later to a relatively fixed corpus of Paul's letters. Furthermore, though many scholars, including its original editor, editor Frederick Kenyon, and many since, believe that P46 originally also included only 2 Thessalonians and Philemon, other scholars believe that the pastorals were included as well. Trobish also apparently believes that this is the case, as he notes that, quote, there is no manuscript evidence to prove that the letters of Paul ever existed in an edition containing only some of the 13 letters. The statement helps to make sense of the fact that there's probably evidence that Paul's letters were known earlier than even P46. First Clement, it's widely agreed, quotes Romans and 1 Corinthians for certain. First Clement also probably quotes Titus, with the possibility of at least alluding to Pauline language found in 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and 1 Timothy. And I don't think that it can be accidental that all but 1 and 2 Thessalonians and 2 Timothy are possibly quoted or alluded to in 1 Clement. The question of who was involved in the collection of Paul's letters is probably more complex than simply deciding between Paul or some other person or persons. The framing of the question often has the person involved in collection of Paul's letters doing so after the letters had been distributed to their various audiences. This is a possibility as the geographical distribution of the letters of Paul is not very wide. Even if one includes the pastoral epistles as letters addressed to individuals located in the Asia Minor Mediterranean area, we have all of the letters confined to a stretch from Galatia in the east, probably Roman provincial Galatia, to Rome in the west, with Colossae and Laodicea, Ephesus, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Corinth in between, a distance of roughly 1,100 miles. Most of the letters were sent to destinations within a radius of not more than about 150 miles around the Aegean Sea, all of them places where there were some Pauline supporters. In the light of the traveling possible during that time, it's not unlikely that someone could have gathered the letter collection that resulted, missing out some letters that were either no longer extant or thought not to be of value, perhaps because of their particularistic nature. Such a process apparently occurred early, resulting in the relative fixity of the contents of the manuscripts that contained Paul's letters and their order. The person involved could have been any of Paul's companions and followers, including Luke or Timothy, two who have been suggested. An alternative to the personal involvement in collecting the letters after the fact is the theory of personal involvement at the time of writing and sending. Whereas some scholars might welcome the idea that Paul himself was involved in his letter collecting, as does Trobish, these same scholars might not wish to limit the number of letters to four. There are a number of factors that indicate that we need not choose between Paul or others close to him as being involved in the process of collecting his letters or necessarily limiting the collection to four. As noted already, scholars for a number of years have suggested that Paul might have made copies of his letters at the time he was writing them with his scribe and missionary companions. This would follow the pattern of many ancient writers, Seneca and Cicero, as literary authors who speak of actual letters, not composites made out of the fragments of earlier letters, and Zenon as a documentary writer among them who made copies of their letters before having them dispatched. This allowed them not only to refer to them in the future, perhaps explaining why 1 and 2 Thessalonians and Colossians and Ephesians, among others, have verbal material in common, but to have them either with them or in the possession of their companions. 
The only explicit statement in Paul that might give the idea that Paul had something of this sort in mind is in 2 Timothy 4.13, a book that Trobish contends is not authentically Pauline and can therefore hardly be used as evidence by him in his theory. Some would contend that what we have here is a later pseudepigrapher, including such a statement in order to create Paul as collector of his letters, rather than Paul himself making such a claim. This strikes me as perhaps unnecessarily deceptive, but instead provides supporting evidence for the authenticity of the pastoral epistles, and hence the entire 13-letter corpus falling within the purview of Paul's authentic letters. Such a scenario has recently been proposed by Bo Rica. Rica notes that consistent with the scribal procedures noted above, Paul worked and traveled with a literary team that was involved in the composition of his letters, Note that letters such as 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon all have salutations from Paul and others. And from the period of A.D. 51 to 61, according to Rica, Paul wrote all of his letters with the help of his companions. The letters fall into two categories, according to Rica: Nine letters to churches and four personal letters. His order of composition is 2nd and then 1st Thessalonians, A.D. 52 to 53, Galatians, A.D. 55, 1 Corinthians, A.D. 56, 1 Timothy, A.D. 56, 2 Corinthians, A.D. 57, Romans, A.D. 58, Titus, 58, Philemon, 59, Ephesians, 59, 2 Timothy, 60, and Philippians, 61 or 62. Rica believes that Philemon, Ephesians, and 2 Timothy were written from a Caesarean imprisonment, but Philippians from a Roman imprisonment. One need not follow Rica on every detail of his ordering of the letters or his theory of imprisonment except to note that Paul ends up having written all of his letters and arriving at Rome. Previous scholars have noted that Rome is one of the possible places where the Pauline collection of letters was made. On the basis of this analysis, the Pauline chronology with regard to his letters could have unfolded something like this. During the course of his several missionary journeys, Paul composed his mix of personal ecclesial letters We've noted that copies of both literary and documentary letters were kept. This alleviates the need for various fragmentary hypotheses of letters, such as Romans 16 and the Corinthian letters. And for each of them, he used scribes, and for many, if not most of them, copies were kept according to the custom of the time. These copies were kept in the possession of either Paul or his companions, which often meant the same thing as they traveled together. Whether he wrote his prison letters from Caesarea or Caesarea in Rome or just Rome, Eventually, Paul was imprisoned in Rome. We do not know of any other letters that he wrote, which means that Paul and his closest companions may have both been directly responsible for collecting together his letters, not as an afterthought by means of visiting all of the various cities and gathering the letters together, hence running the risk of certain ones being lost, but by virtue of their having copies of the letters in their possession. In essence, this means that the collection of Paul's letters also seems to imply the publication of his letters, as they were made more widely known, first perhaps by Paul, and then by successive generations of Paul's followers. One might expect on this basis to have all of the letters that Paul is reported to have written, including other letters to the Corinthians and to the Laodiceans. But the letter to the Ephesians is not this letter. It is not certain why these letters are missing unless they simply were not copied originally. And Richards suggests that Paul's severe letter was sent off in anger and haste, or were themselves lost in the course of Paul's travels. A number of other factors may also be explained or possibly integrated by this scenario. One is the close connection of some of the wording of even the book of Acts in the Pauline letters. If Luke was a traveling companion of Paul and was with him, for example, when Paul was in prison near the end of his life, it explains his access to Paul's writings. A major limitation here is that Luke supposedly gives no direct evidence of knowing Paul's letters in Acts. Useful analogy perhaps can be drawn between how Luke handles Jesus' tradition in his gospel and in Acts. In the gospel, Luke cites the words of Jesus extensively, and there's no question that, as the prologue says, he has used sources such as Mark and others that contain the words of Jesus. However, in Acts, apart from the ascension and words of Jesus in chapter 1, a couple of verses, there's no other explicit indication of Luke's knowledge of Jesus' tradition. In other words, here we have proof that even though Luke knew important facts, he did not feel compelled to relate them. Same is perhaps true regarding knowledge of Paul's letters. What saves this from being sheer hypothesis are indicators throughout Acts that although Luke does not depict Paul as a letter writer or quote his letters explicitly, he seems to know what Paul had written in some of his letters. This is shown by numerous verbal, conceptual, and perspectival factors, as William Walker has shown. Of course, if the compiler was Timothy, the problem of Acts does not emerge as strongly. 
Further, the literary connection between Paul and 1 Peter might be better explained if both of them were in Rome, with the two of them sharing the same scribe, Silas Silvanus. It may also explain how it is that a statement such as is found in 2 Peter 3.16 can be made, which is implied that the author had access to a collection of Paul's letters, that is, that the letters were already gathered together in some way. The scenario of Paul's imprisonment in Rome is also consistent with being able to be involved in such a collection and dissemination process, unless Paul's collection and dissemination took place after his release and before his final imprisonment. Lastly, this scenario would also possibly explain the context 30 years later in which quotation of an allusion to a wide range of Paul's letters in 1 Clement, a letter written to the Corinthian church by Clement from Rome, could occur. If this scenario is correct, it is not surprising that variation in the Pauline corpus occurs within relatively narrow parameters. The corpus of Paul's letters originated in a particular location at the instigation of a small group of one or more people, including possibly Paul and some of his closest associates. As noted already, the variation in the manuscripts that does exist revolves around the book of Hebrews, the alternating of Ephesians and Galatians in P46, some uncertainty over Colossians and Philippians, and whether the pastorals are included. And uh, I've already addressed, I think, the question of Hebrews. As Murphy O'Connor has shown, however, if one does not rely upon only counting characters, but uses other evident ancient forms of measurement, such as the indicated stichoi, the fluctuation in placement of Hebrews is the only real variable. There's otherwise virtual fixity to the manuscript ordering, at least in the early stages. The placement of Colossians before Philippians is understandable, as they are within 200 characters of each other and have similar stichoi in some traditions. In any event, this transposition only occurs in Codex D and a 14th century minuscule. The placement of Ephesians before Galatians only occurs in P46, but this ordering does reflect actual length with Ephesians 700 to 900 letters longer, depending on whose count is followed. This may, in fact, be the original ordering. In other words, the evidence seems to point towards consistency in the composition and ordering of the entire Pauline corpus, whether one accepts P46 or not, not just within three groups of letters. If one removes Hebrews from the Pauline corpus or group of letters, there is a clearly established Pauline corpus that essentially follows the principle of decreasing size from Romans to 2 Thessalonians, what might be called the church letters, then begins again with an ordering in decreasing size from 1 Timothy to Philemon, what might be called the personal letters. So conclusion. Viewing the Pauline corpus in this way, I think, opens up further insights regarding its actual formation. We do not need to divide the corpus into three groups, reflecting three stages of formation. It is possible to view it as two groups, but two groups, each united according to principles of organization and orientation of the letters within it within a single process of formation. It is even possible that Paul was involved in this organizing process. If the corpus of authentic Pauline letters the four that Trobish posits, as, as I and most scholars think is virtually certain, and as the organization noted above seems to suggest, then Paul's chances of being involved are perhaps increased, as he would have perhaps been the only person, possibly apart from his few closest associates, who would consistently have had access to the many copies produced by his scribes and companions. The only other person or persons who would have had access would have possibly been his closest followers, such as Luke or possibly Timothy. If Paul were not the initiator of the collecting process, and if there were not copies of the letters readily available, then the act of instigating the Pauline collection must have fallen to one of these close companions. As Guthrie says, and as virtually all of the theories that uh, I breeze through, except for that of good speed, acknowledge, there's no evidence that Paul's reputation fell into disrepute. Thus, the collecting process must have involved a close follower or advocate of Paul, who perhaps undertook such action near the end of Paul's life, possibly when he was in Rome, in prison, or very soon after his death. Luke is the most likely figure for such a scenario on the basis of the internal Pauline evidence, church tradition regarding Luke's relation to Paul, and even much critical scholarship regarding authorship of Acts. In any case, there's reasonable evidence to see the origin of the Pauline corpus during the latter part of Paul's life or sometime after his death, almost assuredly instigated by Paul and or a close follower or followers, and close examination of the early manuscripts with Paul's letters and related documents seems to support such a hypothesis. Thank you very much.